Let's just start off with a few questions of my own. Please think of, uh, of your own questions for the panel as well. Uh, thank you all of them for the great talks actually today. So a round of applause. Uh, so we'll start off with um, inspiration. So um, I showed a few of the games that um, I kind of inspired me to get into the games industry originally. Uh, what would you say are some people or any games that sort of inspired you originally or continue to inspire you in the games industry? Anything Any of you can start with. Yeah. Anything that Naughty Dog makes. Naughty Dog. Yeah. Um, the main game that I absolutely was obsessed with when I was younger was World of Warcraft. I started it when it, just as the Burning Crusade expansion came out and I'd, I'd stay up. My mum would go on nights and I'd still be on it when she'd come in in the morning. <laughs> uh, and Guitar Hero as well. Oh, my God. Oh, oh God. A Love lot it. of Guitar Hero parties yes. occurred. Yes, yeah. Um, yeah, I don't... Yeah, anyone else? <laughs> Sorry, I was the same as you. Legend of Zelda, Ocarina of Time, N64. Oh, you <laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> Everyone's mentioned it. Yeah, um, and basically for the same reasons. I was like four, I think, when I first started playing it. Um, and some of the fight scenes, so I could do all the little parts around kind of Kokiri Forest by myself and kind of when you play as Child Link. Then you got to Adult Link and the wolves attacked you for the first time. Oh, and I was a hand that dropped down. <laughs> and I was just like, I'm out, I'm out. So me and my dad used to kind of tag team it in. He would go in and do the dungeons. Then I would get to ride a pony to the next place. Yeah. And that may involve a slight detour around Gerudo Valley to jump over the bridge bit a few times. And then we actually go to where we need the to. amazing song. Yeah, so that kind of started it. And then kind of continuing on from that game's like, journey by that game company and Nova Chen and then the subs subsequent work that his team and then Matthew Nava who went on to do um, Abzu those kind of games where it's more you look at story, you look at uh, music and you look at the art and how all that ties together rather than your traditional you need to go shoot and kill something, that kind of side of it kind of really attracted me Cool. Um, me and my sisters actually played loads of Ocarina of Time as well and now it's a Christmas tradition that on Christmas Day we turn Ocarina of Time on and Aww. play it together yeah, um, so that was growing up like, um, like one of the big games in the house. But like I kind of said in the presentation, um, Fable was like a huge one that made me realise people make games because like there's a thing in Fable where you can be good or evil, but the actual narrative doesn't change based on what you were. And I always thought it'd be really cool if the narrative itself changed as well. And that Does was. <laughs> yeah, the, you start like flies start yeah. flying around you, and you're like, eh, and you start doing some good don't things just so you don't like look like you stink. <laughs> um, but like, I, I really loved Lionhead, and I like actually researched like being able to like work with them, and I got in contact with some of like the artists, and then they like closed down. <laughs> I was heartbroken. <laughs> Um, I think for me, the game that obviously I played games before this, but the game that probably I, you know, stayed up all night playing, and like my parents were quite strict. Although my brothers had consoles, for some reason it was sort of I wasn't like allowed them or whatever. <laughs> Sliding, <laughs> yeah. We were promised to slide. Yeah. Um, Day of the Tentacle. Uh, I had my friend Farah and her. Uh, the parental like restrictions at her house were quite. Um, were quite lax in that uh, we were allowed to stay up all night playing it. We were allowed to drink like proper full fat bottles of Coke. It was like unheard <laughs> of in my house and get Domino's. I was like, why is this magical place? <laughs> um, so we'd stay up uh, all night kind of playing that. And um, I don't know, uh, I think actually it's funny. I haven't really thought about Guitar Hero in a really long time. It's interesting oh, you mentioned right. that. But I suppose in some ways, I introduced like so many of my friends who weren't gamers to kind of party games and stuff like that. We would honestly, we'd all go to the pub and we'd all come back to our flat and have like this, you know, people who would never pick up a controller. And I suppose that must have kind of planted a lot of seeds in my head that there is the potential to, you know, bring a lot more people into gaming, but in a, you know, in an interesting way. But it's just that, I don't know, the controller itself has always been quite a limiting factor. And I think once you sort of get rid of the standard kind of controller idea, it suddenly becomes a bit more open, I'm going off on a tangent. Well, PlayLink and things like that now are trying yeah. to do some of that stuff in VR, obviously, in another way, and we did it for a little while. Yeah. Um, Day of the Tentacle is also mine. I played it once a year. I still play Day of the Tentacle. Yeah. It's a brilliant game, and Tim Schafer. Um, awesome. And also, they used to have these tip lines before, like, you could go on the internet and yeah. find out answers. And um, actually, I was hosting the uh, BAFTA Games Awards stream, and obviously, Tim Schafer got the fellowship this year. And I'd never, I'd sort of seen him around kind of before, but I'd never had to interview him 
professionally, yeah. I mean, I drunkenly sort of said at him at other things, but that doesn't really count. Um, and I said to him, oh, I really feel like I put your kids through university. And he was like, why? I was like, because we used to call up the tip line. It was like an 0898 number. You and actually it was, called it. Yeah. yeah. This, is not, the, the, this is what I'm telling you. Her parents had a really, they didn't care. They were just like, have Domino's, drink coat, call up 0898 numbers. It's completely fine. Um, but it was like, press one if you're having trouble in the past. Press two if you don't know what to do with the clown and the fork. Yep. Press yep. three. Yeah, like that. And you Stab went him. To, yeah. Yeah, stab yeah. him, basically, yeah. is the yeah. answer to that. You stab the clown. Yeah. Please play David Tentacle. It makes more sense and we don't sound like uh, mass murderers. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, so, so, welcome, Anna. Hi. Hi. Uh, sorry Hello, for your train everyone. troubles. I'm so sorry I'm late. So we're going to do the talk afterwards and yeah. pretend that this didn't happen. And we'll just, exactly. David yeah. Tentacle-wise, we'll just do past and present and future. Yeah, yeah. 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 perfect. Yeah. Uh, so fluid. we're just talking about inspirations in terms of getting into the games industry uh, and what was your a game or person that inspired you to do what you do? So there's a little bit in uh, my talk, actually, about this. Um, I remember playing Fable 3 and uh, there are some loading screens and I think like when you're when you're a kid and you're playing games you kind of imagine them as like appearing fully formed created by like the gods or something and they just descend down and I had this moment after I've been doing digital art for a little while just because um, I drew a lot of like anime and manga and stuff I just had this moment like this crystallizing time where I was like oh someone actually did that someone did that and I could totally do that as well um, and that was the most fun experience. And I think also uh, Animal Crossing, yeah. like those uh, kind of worlds that you can exist in and enjoy and revel in uh, really made me want to create those for myself as well. Cool. Um, I think it was Julia that touched on the fact that there's kind of games and then there's other entertainment industries, but... Um, yeah, those other ones? Yeah, the other ones. What like, do they know? Well, the, but the thing is, it's like, so film and TV and music, um, Gone with the Wind and Star Wars, the biggest entertainment properties out of traditional media. Obviously, it's a lot older media, all those older ones, but $4 billion is the total that Gone with the Wind and Star Wars have taken. GTA 5, obviously not everyone's cup of tea in terms of content and 18 plus rated, obviously, but six billion dollars worth of tech, so it is we, the biggest we, entertainment. Right? We are the winners. This yeah. is what I mean. This is yeah. why we should get like a throne, a crown, and a scepter. And I always feel like as gay, like as gamers and from the games industry, we sort of we look to the other entertainment industries and we're like, oh, please take us seriously. Yeah. Whereas maybe we just need to be like thumping our chest and be like, you know what? We're the new kids on the block. Yeah. We are way better than all of you. Now you should be looking to us. Yeah. Although, um, yeah, that might be slightly antagonistic. Well, number 10 the other day, we had, we had the creative industries there and it was film and publishing and, yeah. oh, and other stuff. And where other stuff, despite being the largest provider of income into the Well, you the put UK, on like right? another little weird table exactly. in the corner. Yeah, exactly, it is that. But, you know, it's, it's an interesting, interesting thing from a games point of view in terms of being taken seriously for Arts Council funding and other things. So there's actually some genuine things which it'd be useful for, um, for games to be recognised in that way because of it. So do you think that's going to change now or, you know, is the perception and changing gradually? Um, I think, like, from someone who kind of has to sort of go across and peer into the mainstream a little bit, yes, definitely. And I, and I certainly think numbers, like, you know, in terms of what Grand Theft Auto 5 game, it sort of boggles the mind a little bit. It's the same thing with esports. It's when you start, when you, as soon as you start just giving them numbers, they're like, oh, okay. They still don't know quite what they want to do with it yet, but they sort of start to understand they're going to have to. I mean, traditional TV. In itself, I mean, obviously we had things like Games Master, second longest running uh, a video game TV show. First was Cybernet, if anyone remembers that. That was on ITV uh, too late at night. It's rubbish. Um, but there used to be a lot of, you know, gaming content that was on TV. And because normal TV kind of just had this idea that all gamers are kind of weird nerds, I don't know, they stopped making content for us, which is why obviously YouTube became incredibly popular because everyone just went off and did it anyway. But the TV's kind of got to this point now where most appointment to view people tend to be kind of of an older age bracket mm. and they know that they have to adapt because if they don't start appealing to younger people then they literally won't have any viewers later yep. because it won't make a difference and, and obviously gaming is something they know they have to do but it's weird I mean because there's no one solution to a gaming show there's you know gamers are so diverse and you, everyone likes a different type of game and a different type of thing there's no one show for everybody really it, you know, it, would, it needs like a lot of different sort of content, but they tend to sort of like do like one show and then it doesn't really go so well or they try to appeal to everybody and then it doesn't work and they're like, oh, well, we tried gaming. You can't just be, it's not like, oh, yeah. well, we tried football and that didn't work. <laughs> I'm sorry, but try again. It's very popular. It's something that's really important. And if you don't kind of adapt to it, then, you know, where are you going to be? Yeah. Sorry, rant over. No, no, I <laughs> com completely agree. Nope. 
No, no, <laughs> Julia summed it up perfectly. <laughs> okay, yeah. yeah. So we're, 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 we're done with it. We hit, we hit other industries. No, we don't. We want their IPs because they're more recognised sometimes. Yeah, thanks very much, Jess. Yeah. Um, I've completely lost the next point I was going to ask. Um, Is it about sliding? It wasn't about sliding. Um, yeah, so I was going to take a quick ask the audience something, actually. So how many people are currently working in games in the audience? So a couple. OK, how many are at university wanting to work in games? A couple. How many are not doing that but want to get into games right now? OK. Weird if they didn't. Yeah, well, like, just, I really like I, I walked into the I wrong I'd just thing come along. entirely. Um, OK, so in terms of... Um, applying for roles. I mentioned the networking with Jess earlier on and, and the sort of approaches to meet people. Um, I'll give a quick plug now for uh, Gamio, which was mentioned, which is Game Makers Yorkshire. Uh, so that's kind of a, every six months it meets up in Shooter's Bar normally. So it's just to get together and people show off their own local indie games. It tends to be about 250 to 300 people. So it's one of the biggest um, meetups in the UK. Uh, and then every month we have a um, pub meet at Leeds Game Toast, it's called, which is just a meetup. So follow on Twitter, uh, Game Republic, uh, Leeds Game Toast, Gamio. Uh, there's meetups in Bradford, Huddersfield, and Sheffield, I think, isn't it? Yeah. Um, so yeah, just get involved with those. Um, but in terms of other advice, in terms of how do you find the local uh, industries? You know, I mean, these games are made here in, in Yorkshire and other places. Grand Theft Auto V made down the road at Le Rockstar Leeds. How do you go about finding these places? How do you get talking to them? What's the best route into that? I guess you could start by looking at the Yuki map. So Yuki, which is kind of the UK interactive entertainment body, they're kind of like our trade body, kind of. We are, kind, yeah. Yeah, yeah, thank well, you. they are. Um, Different hat. They actually have a map of all the game studios in the UK. There's over 2,000 uh, game studios here, just here in the UK. Um, and you can kind of, you can literally see where they are all based. So even if you think you're somewhere remote, there's probably a game studio closer to you than you probably know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's nothing wrong with Birmingham. Yeah. <laughs> Yorkshire's so good though. There's so Microphone. many in Yorkshire. Oh, that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, there's definitely more kind of hubs that you think may not have existed that are outside of London. I mean, you have Guildford, which is just a little bit south. You have Brighton. Yeah. You have Manchester. You have Leeds. You've even got stuff coming up around Derby, further north. You've got stuff in Dundee, Glasgow, Edinburgh. There's even one right up if you ever want to go visit the top coast of Scotland at Nairn. There's one kind of up near there. Beautiful. Um, so yeah, there's more than you think out there. Yeah. Or things like EGX and like Rest yeah. and stuff like that, where it's like everyone all in the kind of same room. Or if there isn't something that kind of really, you know, because obviously some of you guys are a little bit younger, maybe like going out to the more drinky things is not, you know, really the thing to do. <laughs> yeah. um, but like start up your own, just find friends that want to do it. And you know, if you're having a great time and you bring some more of like your mates along, you can actually start growing your own thing. It's really easy to do. Yeah. Yeah, certainly. I mean, so Unity and Unreal, obviously, great tools that people can download and use. I mean, there's things like Bitsy as well and Game Maker, and there's a lot of communities online that do similar things, and they're very kind of simple game engines. So if you are looking to just start out and just uh, play around with free tools, uh, that's a really good place to start as well. And you can probably, if you want to do stuff through kind of like your skills, if you're in like primary school or secondary school, talk to your teacher and ask them to get in a STEM ambassador. So a STEM ambassador is somebody who goes around and promotes uh, science, technology, engineering, and maths. And you, under it, we have um, our own little section called the VGAs, which are the video game ambassadors. There's quite a lot of us spread up and down the country. So put in a request to your teacher because they can just ask out on the STEM ambassador website and try and get in contact with one of us to come in and talk to you about games or make games. I did one at a primary school where we made a pixel art game. So we used uh, squared paper, coloring pencils, and flash, because that was great. Um, <laughs> and, <laughs> and we built a little pixel art game. And we even did some basic animation and stuff. So there's a lot of stuff that can come to you as well. Just kind of get your teachers involved and say, hey, there's three or four of us that really want to do it. We think the rest of the class would want to be involved as well. Can you go find us somebody? There's also loads of competitions you can enter as well. If you really want to be like an artist, I struggle to, I'm not really great at networking, so I try and get my work out there before meeting people. Um, I did a competition called Rising Star. Um, yeah, 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 can you remember? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, um, basically you enter, it's, is it for, Rising Star is second year at university and Search for a Star is final year. So you get given a brief um, and you have two weeks soul destroying two weeks to make something um you just work so hard um 
and then you get judged on it and then you get put in front of um, a panel of judges who you can potentially get a job from. Uh, I didn't get a job. <laughs> you did something better. I did. I started my own. Um, but yeah, doing things like that, and there's a lot of competitions on a thing called Art Station. So if you haven't got an Art Station page, I recommend you definitely get one because it's a good way for people to see your work. Um, I haven't really got my own website. I just tend to use that as my uh, route for people to see my work. But they do a lot of competitions for, um, they'll give you an inspirational thing. So they've just done one called um, Beneath the Waves. So people have made characters and stuff based on water and things like that and they get ju judged on it but your work gets seen all over if you do things like that so that's a good way to do it and i can definitely pull on that so i used to run like the uh, unreal engines twitter instagram accounts their forums stuff like that art station was one of the best places i could go to because you can tag it using unreal engine yeah. pretty much all of our instagram content kind of came from there and we used to post out something daily and i mean our reach was hundreds of thousands of people wow. so um yeah really really good idea to do that <laughs> Um, another great thing for people that know, like have some technical skills already is game jams. So um, I don't know if Yorkshire have particular game jams, but there's like Manchester have Jamchester every summer. And then um, there's Yuki Shouldn't Game Jam as well, where if you ask like your university to like kind of host a Yuki Shouldn't Game Jam, they'll set it up for you. Um, and then there's uh, Brains Eden as well, which is held in Cambridge. Um, where you get like great prizes for that, like going to like PlayStation's H HQ and stuff, and it's just like 48 hours to have like just something new in your portfolio that'll kind of diver diversify it slightly more. Yeah. Um, it's a great approach. Yeah, game, game jam is definitely a good way to get into doing things and, and just something quick you can throw away and not feel like you've wasted a lot of time with it. So in terms of global game jam, Gorm, who actually co-founded it, he works in this building, bizarrely. Um, so yeah, global game jams every January, I think it is, isn't it, where they host them, so. And you've got Little Mdare as well, yeah. which happens four times throughout the year. And that doesn't necessarily need to be kind of yeah. location-based. You can do that from home, kind of online with other team members. So there's loads of stuff out there. Um, do you have any questions from the audience at this point? I'm just trying to work out time-wise, anyone? Yeah. Is it um, difficult to come with new ideas and concepts that people haven't thought of? And do you get just normal lay people coming up to you on the streets and have got a really good idea for the game? And you think, that's amazing, they know they've never thought of that. Or the art to game design is ripping someone's work off without, <laughs> <laughs> without showing it. Yes. Um, Sorry. I think lots of people, like game designers, are really silly people. Um, so like they tend to just come up with something like really wacky. Like um, and some people are just inspired by like day to day things. Um, so that they start like, it depends on where they want to start with a project. So someone might think of a very like particular art style, and then they'll find out like that there's like a mechanic that kind of complements that art style really well. Or maybe they'll start with a story. Um, or they'll start with the mechanic itself. Um, and it's just kind of this like one seed planted and like it kind of gets really out of control for designers. <laughs> um, I, I was gonna say, I can totally add to that. So I have, has anyone here played Snake Pass? Yes, so we've got a few hands. So um, the guy who basically designed Snake Pass before he became a games programmer, he was biology teacher. And while after he kind of came out of education, he started programming, got into making games, and the company that made it, Sumo Digital, they run internal game jams, kind of coming back to that. And he was practicing with something, and he had a rope that he was trying to make look really good, and it dropped down and kind of coiled its way around and kind of looked like a snake. And he thought, oh, well, I think there's a game in this. And because of his background as a biology teacher, he understood how a snake would move, it's how its muscles will kind of contract to get the movement. And from that came a really, really successful game. Um, and that comes from one guy who used to be a biology teacher. So a lot of the time, I think influences and inspiration can come from outside of the games industry, and especially if you're looking for kind of unique and original content, you can't just keep referencing the same games over and over again, because then you just recycle content rather than come up with anything new. I definitely find that in art as well. Uh, so a lot of the time, whenever I'm working with other artists, I'm always saying we should look outside of games for inspiration, uh, because when, especially as concept artists, uh, we tend to be very self-referential and we just look at the same paintings and everything. But like, if anyone saw like the Met Gala, the dresses in that, yeah. phenomenal <laughs> character inspiration, like fashion, biology, um, nature, there's so much weird stuff that comes out of just natural life and other industries that I think we can take. Uh, and it's always really fun to introduce that because it brings a unique voice that we don't really have enough of. So. I think um, 
one of the stories. Um, how many of you guys know the story of like Brendan Green and PUBG? <laughs> Do you know like, how it? Yeah, how it kind of came about. So it's kind of really interesting because obviously it's not like a fully, completely unique idea for a game. But what's interesting about Brendan's story is that he was nothing to do with games. He was like a part-time DJ, bit of a graphic designer, and had done all this sort of stuff. And he'd gone to Brazil. He'd married uh, someone, gone there. They'd end up getting divorced. And um, he'd obviously like you know uh, modded the game and sort of made the original kind of incarnation of it, but had. Um, was running all these servers them himself and like it was all just a nightmare and he was like if I'm going to kind of move forward with this I need to you know move back to somewhere that has good internet and um, I think he did like a little bit of consultancy work for Sony or something and then basically he got uh, approached by Bluehole and they were like come out because we actually want to make this game he went to Korea a week later he moved and is now living in Korea and, and doing this as a job and it's it's quite interesting really because he didn't have that kind of normal, well, well there's, I don't think there's any yeah, kind of normal yeah. path into it anyway, but sometimes coming at video games with not any kind of quote unquote formal training means that you look at things in a really, really different way. And he says that you know, some of his team are a bit like, he'll suggest a certain way of doing something. They're like, oh, that's not how it's done. But he's like, yeah, but that just makes more sense. And sometimes just being completely fresh mm -hmm. to go into something means that you will look at it in a different way. And you know, I mean, PUBG just exploded. It's, yeah. it's quite, a nice little, quite a nice little story that really for someone who wasn't you know, classically trained in games. So you never know. Yeah, I mean, different approaches work even for programming stuff. So we used to attend AI conferences before AI became the, the current new buzzword, um, just because you'd get different opinions of how to approach certain problems. And then you end up applying AI to some graphic stuff, which doesn't seem to make sense, but just somehow works. Um, to, to the question slightly on, on ideas from the public, we get that quite a lot. So I get random emails, which I just can't open and look at for fear of you know, unsolicited kind of ideas being pitched in. Because if you make it then one day and people think you've stolen it. But yeah, we, we tend to have probably active, I'd say 20 to 30 concept documents that we'd pitch at any one time um, and hundreds in reserve of other ideas. The main problem we have as a studio in terms of making a game is the money to make it <laughs> uh, and whether there's a market addressable to sell it to. So we tend to have a lot of ideas we'd love to make, but yeah, getting the how I mean, much to make it is a problem. I mean, I think like growing up, my dad was very precious about ideas he had. He was like nothing in games or anything like that, but he was always very precious about ideas, you know, just keep them until someone steal them. And actually, as I got older, it's... If you're an ideasy person anyway, you're never going to run out of ideas. And it's almost better just to kind of chuck them out there because actually the execution is the difficult bit. Like we could all have a fantastic, oh, I want to set up like a place that sells really minute things of pasta. Great. That's brilliant. But how are you going to do it? Do you know what I mean? It's the execution that's the really, really tricky thing. Yeah. Unless it's like your absolute, you know, end goal, dream video game idea that you would be crushed beyond words if someone stole. Maybe don't just throw that one around. But, you know, you're going to have lots and lots of different ideas. And I think having the conversations with people about different stuff, you might meet someone who's really interesting in that. And the more you kind of throw it out into the universe, you're going to start meeting people who have experience and kind of help you maybe make that come yeah. true. So if you keep it to yourself, it actually doesn't really get anywhere at all. So, yeah. And you never develop it either, because yeah. the whole point is yeah. you talk to other people, you get them excited about it, you bounce your ideas off them, they yeah. come back with kind of their perspective, which you're like, oh man, I totally didn't think of that. Yeah. And then it just grows and grows and grows. So, And you don't want to be doing anything like super on your own anyway, because it's really depressing. And like, like You need a team of people to make it happen and, and kind of inspire you on, otherwise it's almost impossible to get anything off the ground. Yeah. Any other questions from the audience? Come on, let's do one more question. Someone. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, okay, so this is this is the sort of struggle because obviously BBC has their own platform, iPlayer. Obviously, it's something you know they've invested heavily in and they want people to go to. It does make it kind of slightly trickier because obviously the demo we're pitching to aim at, yes, okay, they do use iPlayer, but they're much more likely to be on YouTube. So we are at this point where they're trying to do kind of more cut down versions that go onto YouTube as well of the show. But yeah, it's, it's just a, it's a tricky thing. It's a tricky thing to sort of negotiate, but we are sort of in, in the process of kind of getting more stuff on YouTube. But it's, it's funny, I think it's with anything that you, you set up, you know, it's a monthly show, it's not a weekly show, so naturally it's gonna be a slower sort of progression. But it's, it's like with anything when you're doing something regularly and especially like a TV show, to kind of build that community takes longer than you think it will, you know? And uh, yeah, so it, it's kind of really only within the past kind of like four or five months, everyone's been like, oh yeah, that thing. Oh good, like well done on that new like BBC thing. I'm like, I've been doing it for like a year. 
okay, all right. But it's just, yeah, things, people find things in different ways. There's so much content out there, you're mm. really competing to kind of get your stuff seen. So it just, yeah, it's tricky. Which I think echoes for games as well, to be honest. Yeah. It's just yeah, yeah, yeah. discovery of any content nowadays is a very difficult thing. Yeah. yeah. Uh, any other questions? Is there anything So, discover, so the question is kind of discovering what you want to do and how do you work that out kind of thing. It okay. took me, like, actually to make a game to realise what I wanted to do. Sometimes you have to adapt to suit what needs doing. So I, I didn't necessarily want to do characters, but they needed doing. And they're really expensive to pay for, so I just got into it. Then realised I loved it. What you learn from that, you'll then adapt to making something else. And then it'll just make all your work seem like you're getting better and it'll like come together. Um, it's yeah. kind of making the best decision at the time. Because yeah. I, I always think it's a really mean thing to say to like, you know, teenagers, like, what do you want to do for the rest of your life? I'm still not really 100% sure what I'm doing, <laughs> even right now. But I think you, you, you look at what the, the potential and the opportunity is at the time. You make your best guess, effectively. And through doing that, like you're yeah, saying, yeah. you either love it or you're like, well, I don't want to do that. Let's move this way. And you just adapt as you go. I think that's probably the, the best advice is just don't overthink it and think about, I'm going to be doing this till I'm like 70 because it's terrifying and no one can answer that question. Can I add as well? Yes. So somebody said to me, it was, they were like, oh, you really need to start thinking about settling down and specialising soon. And my okay. reaction was, you do realise that I'm going to be working for the next 60 years. Yeah. Oh, right? God. I'm <laughs> <laughs> wow. So, Are we? I'm, I'm so that means I could basically do six... I could do 10 different jobs six, you know, for six years each or yep. things like that. And also, I'm probably the proof of this right now, you don't have to do the same thing that you came into the industry throughout the whole time that you're in industry. Yeah. I mean, I went from doing, oh gosh, throughout all the different stuff I've done through uni as well, it's when I went from being a modeler to an animator to a pixel artist to a community manager to now probably back into dev after this. So you're not tied or you're not stuck to doing one thing. You can move about. Once you've kind of got in and you prove that you've got a good work ethic, you're a nice person to be around, and that you're going to add something to a team, a lot of people will take a chance on you. Like, I'd never done pixel art before I joined Minecraft, and I'd never done community management before I joined Epic. But if they see something in you, they're willing to take a risk. So don't feel like, oh, I've made this decision, and I'm now going to be doing this forever. You're not. If you're not happy in it, it's scary, but you can leave and go do something else. Yeah, yeah and don't feel like if you're don't feel like you're developing enough at a certain point. Don't get scared. Like, I've deferred my final year of university, but it's the best decision I've ever made because now I'm running my own business and it's mental. But um, I might even defer again and just carry on. I might just never go to uni. Now you go to uni. But, um, <laughs> but like, you should never be scared and think, I need to be this right now because no. it could come at a certain point and you'll have fun doing whatever you do, so. Just, just to eliminate the word should from your vocabulary. Yeah. The word should is the worst word in the entire English language. Like, I should be, I should have made my decision now. I should be married with kids. I should, like, who, who, who is this galactic council <laughs> who stipulates all this stuff? You know, you're a unique individual person. You will find your own path and your own way when it's right for you. Just eliminate should. Change it to a could, and it completely changes the frame of, like, how you look at something. Yeah. Yeah, I think like a lot of courses give like students these blanket skill sets. And there was this Twitter thread going around recently that um, students should be encouraged to specialize more. But I don't think that's totally fair because they're still going to change their mind like every 10 years anyway about what they want to be. So like, um, so I started in like UI and UX and then moved into production. And now I'm applying for a master's in creative writing and going to like to move like towards writing as well. Um, so like, and that's only me in the industry for like two years and I'm still like sustaining myself. So like, so long as they show a passion for the games and like show an interest in at least evolving these the skill sets, they're going to be fine. Yeah, I mean, something maybe Anna will add to a bit as well is that 
there's a bit of a difference between the AAA studios and the way the indies tend to work. So uh, we're a kind of eight-person team right now. Um, previous studio was 30 people, and we always go for generalists. So we prefer to them as T-shaped individuals. So they tend to be deep in the middle part of the T where the one skill they're really, really good at. And it's kind of a broad part of the top part of the T is the other elements that they all can chip in with. Because on a small team, everyone needs to be involved in all parts of the project. But also they need to understand what's going on with other people's roles and disciplines so they can fit in together and work well together but yeah certainly your rock star leads and other people like that tend to be you're a prop designer or you're an environment you yeah exactly very, very much pigeonholed stuff which is fine in some ways because people like to go to work and say right i'm going to produce cars all day or i'm going to do textures for them or i'm going to do shaders or whatever specific thing a lot of people just work in that way more efficiently and that's how gamers get done on the huge scale that ubisoft and rock stars and other people do but yeah yeah I mean, I'm going to be covering quite a bit of this in my talk, Yes, actually. okay, yeah. sorry, sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, like, uh, there is such a pressure to specialise, and um, I, yeah, like too many things, and I think that, uh, I think indie is gradually increasing in people's awareness. I think there's a little bit of a glorification of going into AAA, um, when, like, there is so much, like, uh, creativity and ownership of, like, the look and style of the game that can be found uh, when that you're working in indie and you're getting to make lots and lots of bits and pieces. Um, but, yeah, like, I, th I think everyone here is probably still doesn't know entirely what they're doing, and that's fine. It's okay. It's a process. Like, and also getting into the industry, it takes time. No one's path is the same, and... Um, comparing yourself to others. Uh, you're looking at everyone else's highlight reel yeah. uh, and everyone goes through struggles. It took me, what, like six months to get my first job. It's taken people who are very, very talented that I know, like years. It's just a process. Um, and I think uh, just having to go through that, it, it's a very necessary part of it. Just be passionate and think of it a bit like a war of attrition. You just gotta just gotta keep going, yeah. keep going, and eventually something will come up. It might take six months, it might take uh, a year, whatever the length of time it is. But as long as you're passionate and you know not uh, rude to people, you should be fine. Because also, I suppose like part of the thing is, yeah, if you're working with a team of people, it's like any job. If you were to get a job anywhere, not just in games, when people interview you, they want to know that you're going to fit in with the team and you're not going to be difficult and cause more problems than you're going to solve. So yeah, just yeah. just being nice, being a bit manners, yeah. being a bit polite goes a long way. Any more questions from the audience? Otherwise, I'm going to ask my last question, then we'll do Anna's. Talk. When are we doing the singing? Sing, the singing's later, definitely later. Okay. Um, next time we'll just do singing. Um, so I was going to ask if there's any kind of um, leaving comments to the panel in terms of what would your um, piece of advice be in terms of getting into gaming? Don't say just don't. Um, that'd be bad. Um, but what would your single piece of advice if you could offer anything? We'll start with Anna at the oh, far end. Oh gosh. Yeah, um, I'll put you on the pressure. Yeah. <laughs> uh, follow your gut, because. I uh, felt a huge amount of pressure when I was at university, especially, uh, to do the things that would get me the job that people were telling me that I was supposed to get. Uh, I tried to, and you'll see some examples, I tried to do really kind of high res, like high detail concepting. I tried to do Magic the Gathering style illustration and nothing resonated with me. Uh, so following your gut, <coughs> sorry, excuse me, and really kind of listening to what brings you joy is the most important, kind of the most useful thing to do because you're going to be doing it for a long time. So just kind of following that feeling, just chase that really good feeling, like that kind of rush that you get when you're creating something. Um, mine's is just be proactive. Like whenever I was finishing university, I didn't know what was coming up. So I just applied for Transfuser. Like we didn't know if we'd get in or not. Um, and now I've just realized that if you just like email and ask, like someone's going to help or you're going to get what you want. So, <laughs> so like I'm trying to start um, Girls Make Games, like kind of more established in the UK. And it's pretty established in the US right now. I just like saw that it existed and emailed them and asked, did they know anyone in the UK that was doing it? And they were like, um, not at the moment, but here's like all of our resources and you can do it. <laughs> so like it was just one question and now I'm like involved in this thing. So just being proactive um, helps. I'm gonna kind of jump on the back of that one. So my one would be pay it forward. So a lot of the time there's a lot of stuff you can get involved in industry. You can volunteer at events, you can go help be like one of the support staff at any of the events, you can help run with the speakers, things like that. And so many opportunities come out of that stuff. It's 
really one of those things if people start to see you around at different things and again you're in a position where you're helping people so that's a good position to be in because people are going to remember you favorably again um that lot of stuff can kind of come from that and when i was when i first started when I went out to GDC for the first time, um, I went up to somebody after a talk and they were like a tech director. I was like, your thing was really amazing. I'd really love to talk to you more. Like me being a student, like, oh my gosh, please talk to me. Um, and they were like, yeah, let's go get, grab a coffee. And I was like, okay. Um, and afterwards we had a really great chat and I was like, how do I ever like thank you for this, for talking to me? And he just turned around and went, just pay it forward. You help, you know, I helped you out. You just go help somebody else out. And it's this whole kind of chain that just builds a really nice industry, but it also builds a really nice presence for you. Um, and can lead to a lot of different opportunities. Um, my advice is just work hard. Just constantly try and try and try. You'll they'll have moments, I've had moments where something hasn't worked and I've cried. And you've just got to get over it, learn from what you can't do and just keep trying basically because you'll get there eventually and it'll be worth it because it's the best feeling ever when something goes right. Yeah, I mean, definitely there's there's always going to be sort of ebbs and flows and kind of peaks and troughs, like whatever career you decide to go into. But ultimately it's, I don't know, sometimes when I have like a really bad day uh, and, and it's all like not going great and you're like, oh, why am I doing this, whatever. And then, you know, I'll have like a friend kind of come over. I had a friend come over the other day and um, I was like, oh, should we like play some games? And we're going, we're going through the thing. He's like, you have all of the games. I'm like, yeah, of course I have all of the games, right? But, you know, you sort of forget. You get so far into the industry, you forget how many, like, great things there are about it, especially reviewing it. You do get access to all the consoles and all the games. There are some wonderful perks. So no matter how bad it gets, you can still potentially have all the games for free, <laughs> yeah, which is yeah, amazing. Yeah. Like, let's Just be honest. Play games all the time. Yeah, yeah. and, yeah. like, I can sit around le legally and in my own mind morally, I can sit around in my gym jams on pad eating crisps, playing games, and I'm like, it's work. You just remind me, my, my Steam backlog's like 4,000 games. I just realized now. That's ridiculous. Anyway, thank you very much for that. That was brilliant. Uh, round of applause for the panel.